It could be argued that before the Tata Altros, the Indian car maker did not really have a premium hatchback. Well, at least that is what Tata Motors itself says. In my view, the Indica and then the Indica Vista, later the Bolt, that sold alongside the Indica were Tata's answer to the then Hyundai Gets, India's first premium hatchback. So interpret that as you will, but for what it's worth, the Tata Altros is here and ready for launch. Tata is calling it the gold standard and so today I intend to test that claim and oh yeah, it is named after an albatross in case you'd missed that earlier. The car is attractive as premium hatchbacks go and it's quite true to the 45X concept, that's the good news and uh, you know you get some interesting design details which are very distinctive. All these black elements that you see around the car, the uh, recessed door handle over here which is cleverly done because uh, I actually prefer the way you sort of grab it to open this way rather than having a handle that comes out so it looks really nice and uh, you've got a really clean rear door as a result of that of course which carries through a lot of the musculature which comes into an almost exaggerated fender again I like that because it's distinctive it's different and the other part of it that is really different is some of these surfaces which are sort of convexing and concaving out and in but with very sharp edges and very sharp creases. In the face, there's a lot of familiarity. You kind of see the evolution of Tata's design. In many ways, it looks like a next generation of a car like the Bolt or the Indica Vista. To me, that's a good thing because like I said, it shows a sort of growth journey for the same brand. That kind of familiarity is not a bad thing. And at the back again, look at all these angles and you know recesses that you see, a lot of use of black. It is different, it is distinctive, and frankly, I have to say, I like it. The two cars on your screen are the Altros Diesel and Petrol, dressed in downtown red and high street gold respectively. I will begin by taking the red one on the road. We are in Jaisalmer, heading in the direction of Longewala, close to the India-Pakistan border. The roads here are excellent. Good tarmac, some undulations and corners and hardly any traffic. Perfect for testing this one. There's a good amount of grunt that you get from this engine. On the power side though, things are a little bit lacking, especially at the lower end. It doesn't necessarily have that nice punch to really kick in and get off the block quickly. The turbo lag doesn't help and yes, there is a fair amount of it. In fact, till you get to about 15, 1800, maybe 2000 RPM, you'll find that uh, the engine seems to be wanting. After that, the coasting is really nice. And uh, the good news is that uh, you don't really hear the engine that much because the sound damping from the engine compartment to the uh, cabin has been pretty well done. You do pick up a little bit of wind noise though at higher speeds, which is a little annoying, but otherwise uh, it's pretty good. The other thing that's annoying, well, it's the engine's turbo. You do hear that whine and whistle from the turbo which is kind of strange because otherwise you don't hear the clatter from the diesel. But uh, yes, at higher speeds especially, that starts to seep in and really, really starts to tick you off after a while. The diesel is very good to drive overall though and the big reason for that is the added heft that only complements the excellent ride quality and good handling. While I would shave off just a few points on handling, the ride is absolutely impressive. The car feels premium, big and sophisticated in its road manners. If the ride quality is the one big takeaway for me, well, the second one is the gearbox. I like how it's been mated to this engine. 
You don't need frequent gear changes as well, even in city traffic. And then out on the highway, it coasts quite nicely too. So you don't necessarily get a sense of everything being as premium as it should be in a premium hatchback. And my little bugbear, the thing that annoys me, well in any car frankly, but more so because this is a premium hatchback. Why is the steering, Tata Motors, why is the steering only adjustable for height and not for reach? It should be telescopic. Most of the competition cars do have it. The Altros should have had it too. Overall, the cabin is roomy and well-appointed in terms of features, but there's a lot more to talk about. So let's pull over, shall we? The car's big USPs on the inside are ambient lighting, automatic climate control, a 7-inch floating touchscreen with a Harman entertainment system, a rear reverse camera, and the 7-inch screen in the part digital instrument cluster. Then there's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, cruise control, auto wipers and automatic headlamps, push-button start and the start-stop fuel saving system. A lot of these are only the preserve of the top two of the four variants on offer. The same is true for the LED daytime running lights and alloy wheels on the outside. A black contrast dual tone roof is optional on the top end XZ variant only. The good news is that dual airbags and ABS are standard. And given Tata's focus on safety, I expect a good crash rating for the Altros when that happens. The cabin on the Altros is thoughtfully designed, it's roomy and uh, it's also got an interesting layout in design terms. The part that bothers me is that some of that design has been executed too well. So while I like the surfaces, I like the way, you know, you've got a sense of this sort of floating structure here, you've got a screen, you've got different textures and layers, and you've even got some of the recessed surfaces to sort of mimic what's happening on the exterior design. It's the execution, like I said, so this plastic could have been better. Just the overall feel that you get from it is not that of a premium hatch. I think darker, richer colors and better plastics would have really done the trick. I mean, you've got the sun visor, you've got uh, the little bin here. Just all of it still feels a little bit cheap and therefore, I feel like there's just that little bit lacking when it comes to the cabin. The same is true of the screen. The visibility isn't great always in bright uh, light and then you've got an interesting instrument cluster where more than half of it is now a digital screen, but it's just too busy. There's way too much going on on it it takes some getting used to. But like I said, in terms of features on paper, you really get a lot of equipment. You've got not just cruise control, not just the steering mounted controls, not just a whole lot of information in that digital screen. You also get the little activity key so that you can leave the car key in here and I don't know, go windsurfing or whatever you want to do, rock climbing. But yes, you can do all of that with the activity key. So it's got a whole lot that will impress a lot of people. You've got the Harman sound system, but it's just the buttons, the feel, everything just lacks that last finish, which could have taken the car a whole level higher. But criticism aside, the cabin is appealing in terms of the space and also sense of space that you get. The seats are comfortable front and back, and you get rear AC vents on the top end variant. The touch screen and digital instrument cluster screen have different color themes that you can opt for as well. The ambient lighting though is only in one shade, a sort of aqua or turquoise like color. Now there are four different trim levels that the Altros comes with, but in addition to that, it's the first time that a mass manufacturer is also offering different customization packs. And the good news is that you can add those packs across variants. There's a whole lot of permutations and combinations, but I want to take you through it because it is 
something that nobody's done before and so it allows even an entry or a base variant buyer to opt for something like a two-tone roof. So the four packs are called Rhythm, Lux, Style and Urban. They allow you to add a three and a half inch touch screen to the base variant or the seven inch to the mid. You can also get the contrast roof on the third variant, for example, or the leather wrapped steering, or even the armrests or reverse camera. There are many features that the packs will get you and it's all factory fitted and not accessorized at the dealer end. Yes, that will take some detailed understanding and possibly its own review, I think. But it's a great move from Tata and one that I think buyers will really appreciate. I hope that the dealers can explain it to them is all. Okay, now let's get to that petrol as promised. The petrol engine is a three-cylinder, the one we know from the Tiago. Like the diesel, this one too is BS6 compliant. The engine is surprisingly energetic but lacks the feel of ample power. Yet, most buyers will find it adequate, especially for city use. I come back to the whole premium hatchback tag. Now that's where you expect a little extra. You expect not just better equipment, not just more space, not just better drivability, but also a little bit more power. And I get it. The whole idea of throwing in this engine tells me that Tata wants to be aggressive on pricing. So why not have two options? You brought in the Tiago's three-pot. Well, give me the 1.2 turbo from the Nexon as well. I mean, you have that engine in your portfolio. You are going to upgrade it to BS6 for that car. Why not? Why not offer it in an Altros, which is in a segment that sits higher than the Nexon? Yes, I genuinely believe Tata should be offering both options. The market is shifting towards petrol again anyway, and it just makes sense to have two petrol offerings as a USP. In many ways, cars like the EcoSport, Venue and Seltos have even made it a norm. Okay, those are all SUVs. All the more reason Tata could play this as a trump card. Now, this is especially true when it comes to decisions about the automatic Altros, which frankly should already have been ready to launch. As far as automatic goes, because that's the other area where uh, we've had lots of questions, I had a chance to speak with Tata's senior management here and um, they've shared that there is an automatic coming. It's only on the petrol and it will not be an AMT, thank God. And that makes sense because I think they understand and they've said very clearly uh, in my conversation with them that Look, in this segment, and given the image and premium sort of appeal that we're trying to establish with this product, it can't be a basic gearbox. It has to be something sophisticated. So we still don't know if it's going to be a CVT. We still don't know if it's going to be a dual clutch. But look at that. I mean, the, uh, the Baleno has a CVT, so does the Jazz. The uh, i20, of course, gives you a torque converter. You need to have something that's going to be fun and engaging and uh, also sophisticated. So. Tata hasn't made up its mind on uh, where it's getting that, so it's going to be shopping around for that. We don't know what vendor, we don't know the launch timeline, but we do know that an automatic petrol Altros will come. The car gets two drive modes, which you can toggle with this button at the base of the gear shift. It's like what we have seen on some other Tata models, and so you get city and economy modes. City drive mode activated. For what it's worth, the city drive mode is the one you want to stay in because the economy mode just kind of dulls things out a bit. The whole point, of course, being that you get better mileage as a result. But um, yeah, I would stay with the city mode even on the highway. It's nice in a way that the car at least has different drive modes because uh, the competition doesn't really offer that. So it's a good USP. Okay, so there is plenty going on here on the Altros, but I suspect the biggest strategy from Tata would be to undercut the competition on pricing. All this, the sexy styling, that exhaustive feature list and the decent performance attribute, but at prices that seem like a steal. That's my expectation and it's a beat that Tata missed with the Harrier, I suspect. And seeing that car suffer for lack of an automatic should be a learning to Tata 
as about 30% of the premium hatch space is now auto. That said, I expect prices to start at about 5,10,000 rupees for the petrol and 6,20,000 for the diesel. I also expect the top end XZ to be priced at about 7,35,000 for the petrol and under 8 lakh rupees for the diesel. Of course, the additional packs and contrast roof options would add to that. On the whole, this is a good effort from Tata, one that could have truly hit that gold standard if the cabin had appeared just a little more plush. So a lot of the things that I have issues with are things that can be potentially fixed quite easily. We're talking, you know, future variants or facelifts, you know, get me a more powerful engine, change the trim levels, but the stuff that you can't really change, not till a new generation cycle, is uh, some of the fundamental things that go into a car and that's where I think it's good that Tata has focused on keeping the product really solid. We've already talked about ride and handling on the diesel. You know, that's a good, strong area for this car. Stability and overall composure, even at high speeds, that is again something that uh, holds the car in good stead because it tells me that this Alpha architecture is going to hold on to that promise, presumably, on future products that come on the same platform as well. It is the biggest two-wheeler party in India. It is where bikers, motorcycle enthusiasts come together for two days of reveling and celebrating everything that is associated with two wheels. It is the India Bike Week. We are in Goa, in the land of sun, sand and surf and we are here for the 2019 edition of the India Bike Week. It's Asia's largest biking festival and on day one itself it's up to 6,000 participants. It's bigger, better and even sexier than before with all the lovely people around and of course the big motorcycles as well. The IBW is all about motorcycles and it serves as a great platform for two-wheeler manufacturers to launch and showcase their products. KTM served up a surprise by announcing the launch of its Husqvarna brand along with revealing the India spec KTM 390 Adventure. Triumph 2 launches Behemoth, the Rocket 3R and the other interesting unveil was the Orha Mantis electric motorcycle. For those who were keen on wanting a piece of riding competition, Harley Davidson had organized a flat track oval and received more than 500 entries. The fastest riders were given cash prizes. Apart from bikes and bonhomie, the food at IBW was lip smacking too and we could not help but devour platefuls. Lastly, but definitely not in the least, the India Bike Week saw some breathtaking stunts and daredevilry from FMX Forever, one of the best stunt teams in the world. The way they took to the skies with the jumps was a sight to behold. If you are a motorcycle slash party enthusiast, then you should have been at the India Bike Week and been a part of the revelry. If not, there's always the next time. Just so you know, IBW will be back on 4th and 5th December 2020. And it is never too early to plan that Goa trip. <laughs>